The hope is understanding the risk factors, which would be genetics, a change in diet, stress, trauma, and treating early. Kids get better, and they get better quickly. If you want to live like you matter, ditch the pills, look great, and feel freaking amazing, you're in the right place. I'm Dr. Wendy Trubo. I'm Dr. Ed Levitan. Welcome to the Five Journeys Podcast. <laughs> where we empower you to live a vibrant and healthy life by optimizing your structural, chemical, emotional, social, and spiritual lives. Hang on to your hats. Welcome to the Five Journeys podcast, Live Like You Matter. We're very privileged today to be joined by Dr. James Greenblatt, a pioneer in the field of functional medicine and psychiatry. He has been treating patients since 1988, and he is a founder of Psychiatry Redefined, an educational platform dedicated to the transformation of psychiatry. He is the author of eight books, including his latest one called Answers to Anorexia. We've known Jim for, what, at least... Not since 1988, I'll say that. Not 88, but five, eight years. And it's been really a privilege to know you and get to know you personally and better and professionally better and helping us treat our patients. So thank you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me and nice to see you guys again. You too. So let's dive in. Yeah. So anorexia, I mean, that's a scary subject, truthfully, especially with people. We have four kids between us. That makes it sound like we, you brought two and I brought two. (laughs) We actually had four kids together. (laughs) Oh yeah. (laughs) So let's define anorexia. Let's, would you mind? Sure. But I, I'm going to use your word, scary, um, you know, is a, a word that we need to kind of understand because this is anorexia nervosa is the most life-threatening illness of any psychiatric diagnosis, highest risk of suicide of any psychiatric diagnosis, highest stress on caregivers. And, and more importantly, we have no treatment model in the traditional uh, medical community, in the traditional psychiatric community, and in our integrative and functional communities. So yes, scary is a good word. You know, by definition, it's a psychiatric diagnosis in the DSM, and it has to do with a disorder of restricted eating that results in distorted thoughts. So this perceptual distortions where someone continues to lose weight and likely um, uh, mostly underweight and feel that they're overweight and obese. And it is that kind of distortion that results in um, really unrelenting turmoil and medical complications that our medical community has really just um, ignored. So I just had this thought, is this, is this the epitome then of a body dysmorphic syndrome that what they're seeing is not what is real? A- absolutely. Talking to you know ma- any a- an- anorexic patient, that they believe uh, and their brain believes it. We understand now the brain um, is tricking uh, the body and there's probably some genetic origins to that, that when they do look in the mirror, they do look at their body parts, they do see um, something different than you and I would see. So have eating disorders increased? Because it seems like I'm from our friends, our kids' friends, Seem that seems to be a relatively common oh, diagnosis. Super common. Yeah, no, the, the um, in, in 10 years, uh, ending up into 2018, the, the incidence has doubled. Ten. Wait, what? 10 years? Yes, uh, uh, from 2008 to 2018 was the last big study. So incidence has doubled. You know, right now, you cannot get your child into an eating disorder treatment program anywhere in the country. There's waiting lists for residential for inpatient, for outpatient therapists. So it, it really has exploded. Uh, relapse during COVID for people that have recovered, we see all the time, but also new onset. People are home, struggling. I've heard stories from someone just trying to get healthy and exercising, others that are on social media comparing themselves and decided to, again, try to lose weight. So we have a lot of parents in our practice. And obviously, you know, a lot of parents, how would a parent even identify that their child is either at risk or may have developed an eating disorder or some kind of body dysmorphic? What are the cues that parents should look for? Because, right, I'm thinking I'm always on alert 
but I don't really know what to look for. I'm just, you know, a parent. Yeah, I, I think the most important thing is um, in the back of our minds as parents to understand um, family history. So if there is a family history and it could be a first degree or second degree relative of an eating disorder, that's a red flag. Just put it in the back of your head. It doesn't mean your child will develop it, but higher risk and pretty significant. Highest heritability of almost any psychiatric illness. And then also family histories of OCD. So obsessive compulsive disorder. And then the first thing we just want to identify is a change in diet. And the sad reality is some of our pediatricians um, are telling kids they need to lose 10 pounds. And for some kids, they might watch what they eat or exercise. Other kids, they start this path of a diet and they can't stop. And it results in a weight loss. So a change in diet either because the BMI report card at school or the pediatrician or a parent said something can be the trigger. And then to me, one of the most important messages of this book that I just wrote, which it might be a little controversial, is that a vegetarian vegan diet in adolescence is a risk factor. So it's not just trying to lose weight. It is this vegan um, diet in adolescence that has been shown in the literature for almost 20 years now to be a risk factor in onset, slower recovery, and higher relapse rates. Hold on. So the earth is round and there's data to support this. So, I mean, it's, you say it's controversial, but if there's data to, like, if, it, well, if it's borne out in the literature. Right, but I want to know why. Now, I know, now I'm curious now. why, but, but he said it was like, you know, sort of asserting it, but you're asserting studies. Oh, I, my whole professional career, there's nobody who's seen an eating sort of patient um, because 90% now are coming in on a vegan vegetarian diet. The only controversy is our, you know, our vegan um, vegetarian community has um, shifted into the traditional medical world. There are now vegan diets in hospitals across New York. Um, and, you know, our culture, eating a vegan diet is a higher spiritual you know, entity. So that's the controversy. The science is clear. In adolescence, our kids need higher amounts of zinc to get through puberty, and our kids need fat and certainly B12 and amino acids. And, you know, my premise is this perfect storm. Again, genetic vulnerability, a, a vegan diet, uh, lower in zinc, and that zinc deficiency again, with good research to support it, is one of the triggers for some of the physical symptoms, the poor digestion, the depression, the lack of sleep, and some of these perceptual distortions that start early on in puberty and just snowball into anorexia nervosa. So as parents looking at their children, what are some of the things, the diseases that parents might confuse anorexia for? It's not anorexia, it's whatever. Well, no, really important question, because also I think missed by our medical community is two that, that you guys are familiar with is celiac disease and, and pandas. So I, I think that if you have a 12-year-old a who's just um, losing weight and getting thinner um, and uh, no GI problems, I mean, there's, you know, half the celiac cases are non-GI related. So um, and, and celiac disease is this rapid road to nutritional deficiency, certainly zinc. And, and the uh, incidence is, is common. I forget the statistics, but we're not we're talking about high numbers of crossover. But nobody's checking for celiac. And then pandas as well. These um, pandas kids are having strikingly severe eating disorder symptoms um, that, that come and go. So those are two medical conditions that are often confused and not always um, addressed by our pediatricians. So go to your local functional medicine doctor to get to find out, correct? Absolutely, yeah, it's critical because again, if we treat this at age 12, you know, we can really eliminate the illness. Uh, if we wait till 22, it gets harder, and then at 30 and 40, um, every year the, the mortality rates increase um, pretty dramatically. Every 10 years that someone has this illness, so you're saying a lot of this is precipitated by zinc deficiency, B12. So how much do you believe 
what percent and i know this is going to be an impossible question to answer so <laughs> i'm going to preface this but what percent do you believe is biochemical versus social emotional psychological for 50 years we've been blaming parents and blaming magazines and models and social media but what's happened in the past 10 years is the the medical community at least has provided the research international um, genetic studies, brain studies, MRIs, everything is now clearly pointing that this is a brain-based illness, okay? So what might trigger these changes in the brain? They could be, you know, uh, family dynamics. It could be trauma is significant and uh, kind of the social media, bullying, stress, all those things contribute, but eventually those things impact a genetically vulnerable kid and triggers this biochemical process. And the treatment for kids that end up in hospitals or residentials, the psychological has just not been helpful. And that's the model. And that's why I'm so passionate because for 50 years, we have barely changed our treatment model and our outcomes are terrible. Highest relapse rate of any psychiatric illness. So it's not the vegan or vegetarian diet per se. It's not the special diet part. It's the that it's missing critical ingredients that developing brains and bodies need. Is that accurate to say? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So if for somebody, for religious reasons, most of these kids aren't coming in for religious reasons. But if they are and they need to restrict, then yeah, absolutely, we need to monitor zinc, B12, amino acids, and we can prevent some of this uh, downward spiral. So I'm not asking everybody to eat meat. I'm, a I'm making sure that they have these nutrients that are much more bioavailable in animal products. How does this transmit into other disordered eating patterns? So you know, we're speaking about anorexia and you have your new book, An Answers to Anorexia, but are there parallels between binging, purging, other other things? Sure. I mean, I, I think um, in, in the old days when I started, there used to be really clear. Uh, someone walked in with the anorexia nervosa, someone had bulimia, someone had binge eating. And now, you know, the diagnoses emerging and they changing. Someone might have anorexia at 14, bulimic at 16 and binge eating at 18. Let's define that for a second. Yeah. Those are, are patients that um, might restrict calories um, but also use this comp compensatory um, purging behaviors. So oftentimes it's, it's vomiting. So vomiting up the food. And this could be once a day to people purging every time they eat. Could be 10 or 15 times. And then there are individuals that are binging, binging on massive amounts, thousands of calories at a time, and then purging. And then that their other group which is actually the most common, a lot of people don't know this, the most common eating disorder is binge eating disorder. Uh, it's probably more 10 times more common. And uh, in my experience, it's much easier to treat. We, we have medicines that do work. We have nutritional interventions that work. And we actually have therapy, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy that works. So if we combine those programs, we can support uh, patients with binge eating disorder. And is the, are the cues the same for parents when they are concerned? I mean, because eating disorders is just this huge bucket. Anorexia seems a lot clearer that the child's restricting losing weight. But then how would parents know to look out for purging or binge eating? I mean, binge eating might be clear, but the purging seems like because it's occurring often in the bathroom where the parent isn't. How would a parent identify that? Yeah, it's really important. One is just to, to listen and to ask the questions and listen. Um, a lot of this would start from, you know, body shaming or feeling bad, either peers at school or parents. I mean, parents are culprits for this. And so it's really the open relationship and, and asking the question. And I think the hardest part is the stories we hear about parents you know, getting their 10-year-old signed up for Weight Watchers and making them go to the gym and making them do this, which is kind of humiliating and just shaming. 
So I think parents need to really be in touch with their issues around food and body image. So there's some definitely clear things parents should not be saying, right? So you're fat or you look fat or, or you need to lose X amount of weight, I think would go into pretty easy buckets. Are there more subtle things that we're doing as parents that we should not be doing that we might not even recognize? Yeah. I mean, I think it's, um, you know, making good and bad foods is really important that, you know, the concept of moderation has to be built in. As parents, we're always struggling with what we know as bad, you know, refined sugar. It's hard to come up with a a good reason. Um, But these kids are functioning in a social system where kids are eating different foods. Uh, The other part, uh, which, which I see, which is the tragic one, are the kids that are hiding foods. So those kids with binge eating disorder that they're not allowed to have candy, but they're sneaking it and the parents are finding wrappers in the drawers and, you know, hidden in cracks in the house. And one of the things that I've learned over the years where the research has supported it is kids with ADHD, particularly girls with ADHD, often struggle with eating disorders, uh, more likely binge eating disorder. So if you have a young um, a girl with ADHD, I think it's important to to talk about eating because the same impulse control that might interfere with school sometimes would interfere with controlling uh, intake of foods and second and third and fourth helpings. And oftentimes treating the ADHD can be helpful. No, that makes sense. All right. So I have a question for a friend. Our kids are obviously like perfect. Obviously. (laughs) And and they eat perfectly well and they don't, they behave perfectly. But let's say theoretically, hypothetically. Hypothetically speaking, asking for a friend. Right. Yeah. That we do find wrappers and uh, food. How would one address that? Is that a direct, what's going on? Is that, how would you recommend parents speak to their kids? I I think to prevent a problem down the road, it would um, have to be letting them know, you know, we found the wrappers. I don't want you to hide this. It's fine for you to eat it um, at the kitchen table. Because if that doesn't happen soon, it just becomes um, a secret. And then that secret, plays out with many different parental dynamics and and then emotional eating, you know, just kind of uh, snowballs into places you don't want it to be. Sometimes, you know, the most helpful, let's say it's, you know, it's candy and in in your house, you don't really have, you know, buckets of M&Ms and it's not something that you do, which, you know, many of our families and friends aren't doing. I think if the kids are craving it, then participating, making sure that they understand that, that, that you can do that with them. You don't have to do that every day, but, you know, to have something that they would want to enjoy, whether it's a healthy dessert that you made at, at home, uh, just to anything you can do to eliminate the hiding and the sneaking. Yeah, I can see parents having issues with, well, those aren't foods that we eat in our home, or those aren't foods that we have, or that's not how we eat. So, how do you send that message to kids? Like, we don't want you sneaking. We're here to support you. We understand you might really want it. And then what? Like, then, then what? Then you eat it with them. You <laughs> eat it with them. <laughs> you no, know, it's challenging. You know, it's challenging. My kids still, you know, one's 30 and the other one's 20. Uh, they still make jokes about, you know, you know, not having, you know, a house full of junk food um, compared to their other kids. So you said there was hope when we before we started filming. You said there was hope, and we wanted to focus on that. Right. <laughs> so, well, yeah, actually, that goes to my question of: Do you have like an example or two of real people of how, you, where they started, and how long it took, and what were the interventions, and just kind of can you give a few examples? Sure. No, but let, let's start with with Wendy's word hope because that really is what keeps me in. You know this kind of trying to sh- share this message on eating disorders. And, and the hope is understanding the risk factors, which would be genetics, a change in diet, stress, trauma, um, and treating early. So absolutely with many kids, and you know, I've been working with in hospital and residential, and I don't know, about six years ago, we 
I stopped counting, but we had over 10,000, you know, patients come through our uh, treatment center here at Walden. So I've seen a lot. So the, the kids that we can treat at 12, 13, and 14, we get them on a nutritional program. And it's not aggressive. It's just, you know, a little zinc, fatty acids, amino acids, digestive enzymes. So the food that they're eating and then probiotics. So small kind of nutritional interventions with for these younger kids, family-based therapy, because the parents have to be part of the solution, kids get better and they get better quickly. The older, you know, as we get to 19 and 21 and the 30-year-olds, those are patients that are challenging in that the nutritional repletion takes more time, right? They kind of neglected their, their bodies, their malnutrition has been embedded for so much and the, and the brain changes are significant. So th these are patients that we've treated, you know, over a year. But again, they're faithful with their nutritional supplements. Oftentimes they're on medications. But over the course of that year, they at least can use words like recovery and, and remission. So there's clearly hope for anorexia. The binge eating, um, you know, it's much uh, more quickly. We can find results. We have good medicines that work. For those that need immediate relief, and we also, with binge eating disorder, we see classic nutritional deficiencies of B12 and vitamin D, and those get repleted quickly, and we can use uh, nutritional supplements and or medicines. There is hope. So it sounds like a bar, it's like a bar stool. So there's the cognitive therapy for the binge eating along with the medication. So that, and the family participation. And then for the anorexia, there's the... Well, there's always the nutritional repletion. And the nutritional repletion. So it, there's a number of components you put together for each of them. Yeah, the BART stool, yeah, is a great analogy for the binge and that that's treatable. And, and I, I use the term food addiction with binge eating disorder. So now whenever I talk about it, and, and some people don't like the concept, how can you be addicted to food? We can't live without food. And, and I agree, you can't be addicted to broccoli. But sugar, you can. Exactly. And, you know, MSG, sugar, uh, abnormal breakdown products in dairy and wheat. So the, the food addiction is to process food, and, and we understand that chemically. So binge eating and food addiction, the, the stool analogy is great. Cognitive behavioral, nutrition, and medicines. For anorexia, Probably need a table, probably need four legs to organize a uh, treatment. A dining room table. A dining room table, maybe even six legs, but it can be done. And I think the medical community, you know, has to be better equipped to, to treat our patients with anorexia. Once people recover, what are things that might set people back? And, and, and what are things people can do to prevent having a relapse? Yeah, I mean, one of the last chapters in the book that I uh, recommend sometimes parents read first is, you know, relapse prevention, because absolutely like any illness, um, uh, things are fragile. So any kind of um, stress, uh, any change in diet, any medical complication, someone goes in for surgery and they don't eat for a few weeks, um, someone who's routine around exercising and has a knee injury. And then uh, mostly stress um, can precipitate this illness. So we have kind of a list of, of, of things that parents can do. And the order um, to me would be, you know, one thing we talk about is, is the listening, which I mentioned earlier. So, you know, active listening, make sure you talk to your child and understand what's going on. Get them kind of back into therapy if they're not. Get them back on supplements if they're not. and you know, if they need a, a treatment program for a brief period of time, the goal is to kind of get them back on path as much as you can. But I, I think that um, relapse prevention has to be in the back of parents' minds all the time. All right. So you're one person, unfortunately. You're one very effective person, though. <laughs> so what are some resources that people can find that can help them? Where, where can you point people to to help this kind of approach, because obviously this is so powerful. Yeah, no, I think that um, 
for uh, these disorders, there's just such a, as you know, a growing number of integrative and functional clinicians, you know, across the states. And when we started, it was just kind of a few. And now there are well-trained pediatricians and family doctors and specialists. I talk to new docs every day who are, are doing it. So I just urge um, parents to look for that integrative and functional uh, practitioner because this is not as challenging as some of the other disorders that, you know, we might treat, you know, including Lyme and mold and things that take some effort. We're talking here about, you know, three basic nutrients, zinc and essential fatty acids. We're talking about um, basic screening tests. So I think for parents just looking for someone who can support them in uh, an integrative and functional approach. Awesome. Got it. Jim, this has been great. For those of you who are listening, we're with Dr. James Greenblatt, who's the author of eight books. The latest one is called Answers to Anorexia. Dr. Greenblatt, do you have a website you want to point people to or a Facebook or book link? Is there something you want to tell people about? Uh, sure. The, the, my website is jamesgreenblattmd.com, and that's where there's information on the books and, um, and, and the, on Amazon. And then we have a training program, mostly for professionals, but some parents can appreciate some of the courses on anorexia, and that's psychiatryredefined.org. Got it. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today. This has been fantastic. We're really grateful yeah, you came Yeah, it's been truly a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Nice to see everyone again. Take care. Dr. You James Greenbot, thank you. Don't go it alone. It's not a social journey until others join. Share this with your friends. 